In the previous session, we designed and manufactured a little rotary fixture for use on this machine. And today, we're going to put it to the test. No, this is not a weapon. This is in fact a rolling pin. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to engrave on here a pattern for biscuit making. First of all, we'll go and take a look at the file itself in RD Works, and then we'll come back to the machine and we'll show you how we're going to set the machine up. Well, here's the file that I've drawn. It's a pretty simple pattern. Um, and the rectangle that I've got here, well, first of all, the width is the width of the roller. And the height of this pattern here, this rectangle, is the dimension of the circumference around the outside of the rolling pin. I've converted it into a flat surface and then I've fitted an appropriate number of hole patterns into that rectangle. Now the key thing to look at here is the gap at the top and the gap at the bottom. Two very small gaps um, which will allow me to have a small amount of mismatch in the pattern without it showing. In other words, if this gap that I finish up with is a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller, it's not an issue. The last thing I really want is for the patterns to overlap. So I can simplify life a lot by making that as the whole pattern. Now, I have put the little green square, which is the head position, right at the top center there, because that guarantees that I can align the nozzle with the center point on the rolling pin. A quick look at the parameters. I think speed wise we're going to have that up at around about 200 millimeters a second. Is blowing? Well this is an engraving process and I don't have blowing for engraving. I turn it off so it'll be no. It's a scan. Power? Well I don't think we're going to be... we're going quite fast. We're in a beech wood um, I want it to burn maybe a millimeter, millimeter and a half deep. Here's where we're guessing. I shall go for 40%. Now I think we'll try and put some ramp effect in here. Put a slope on the side of the cut. Okay, let's go and see if we can make this happen. Here we've got everything that I need to do the job. One of the most important things that you're going to need, apart from the fixture, is a flat surface to roll it on. Now I don't mind what flat surface you use, it could be a piece of acrylic, a piece of glass, a piece of steel, a piece of MDF, a piece of plywood, anything that's flat that will allow this to roll backwards and forwards. So certainly a honeycomb bed or a slatted bed you'll need to cover. Now you saw me manufacture these parts but I never did mention them the last time because they're not actually part of this fixture. Now I mentioned how this worked before by pressing against the gantry. Now the only problem with that is, in this instance, the head is going to run to one side and to the other and smack into these, depending on what length of job I do. So I don't want to run that risk. So what I've done, I've adopted a slightly different strategy. Basically what I've done, I've extended the gantry forward. How on earth can you do that? But well, basically this piece here is a sliding shoe that sits on the Y rail and pushes up against the bearing block. And we have one for this side as well. So let's put the head towards the back and put our block on. And now what I have here is a piece of square steel bar. It's quite heavy. It's about half inch square. Now before I drop that into place I'm just going to do something a little bit silly. And I'm going to put four small elastic bands on it. Now you'll see why they're coming to play in a minute. So we drop the bar into there and basically what that bar has done it's acted a bit like a cow catcher on the front of a car or a bumper. That is now sitting across the front here and make sure that when the head comes forward like this and of course it's being pushed forward by the bearing blocks so it stays completely parallel and doing exactly the same thing as the gantry but it's some four inches further forward. It will then catch the rotary device and push the rotary device forward. As you can see there, if we go too fast 
and we nudge the rotary device it responds and bounces away from the bar I know we haven't got any weight on here at the moment but this is very very light but that's a risk that we can't afford to take I've made sure that this bar and our fixture stay together and we're doing that by hooking this over there like that now that means that when I send it forward it stays completely tied up to the bar okay it's it's a bit crude a rubber band but it's functional along with the rest of this fixture which is crude but functional and actually elegant in its simplicity as far as it will go is when it hits the back frame of the machine now although this is a 400 millimeter depth machine the only depth that we've got to work with for rotary engraving is this depth here because by the time this gets to the front here and hits that's when we run out of stroke so we can't engrave a picture or a, a logo any bigger than say 250 millimeters tall now I know the graphic for this is well and truly less than that so the first thing we're going to do is to take it apart we've got to set this up on the lowest possible position because that means that then that pair and that pair are parallel to each other and I think from where it is at the moment it's probably not far off the right depth there we go so the roll of the end stops are now set but what we do we push that against the back so that it's just lightly against the back and then we'll bring the head forward until it just touches and takes it away from the back so now we can guarantee that we're nice and parallel we've got the bearing blocks all connected up to this bar and everything is running nice and true so what we've now got to do is to set the head so that the head is in the center of the job that's the most convenient way to set it up in the center I'd say that's 215 or 216 we we'll set that up to 108 so that's where I'm going to set my datum my origin and I've already designed this so that the center line of head always comes to the center line of the component so I don't have to worry about looking at it this way because that's part of the design when I manufactured the thickness of the arms and all of this I took this into account so we'll put some extraction on and I will close it because I certainly don't want to put smoke anywhere onto the job I'd like to try and keep it nice and clean So we'll just watch what happens at the end of the stroke. Nothing. The gantry just pulls away and leaves the job where it is. Well, for a budget cost, I think that jig was probably a success. So I should just go away and wash that in soapy water just to get rid of the, the burnt smell. But of course, it won't get rid of the colour. OK, well, having met the challenge of rotary engraving on wood um, that was parallel that was quite an easy shape to deal with maybe we should up the ante a bit and change the shape to something a bit more challenging and also the material which is glass this is one of my wife's favorite wines she says it reminds her of me uh, mainly because it's a bit dry and fruity and nothing to do with the name on the label now before we start engraving on glass there are a couple of things that you really need to understand first of all glass does not cut and it does not burn but we can etch it 
and that's because of some interesting mechanical phenomena that happens when you fire infrared energy at a glass surface. Now in one of the previous sessions when we were talking about engraving on stainless steel we talked about the laser beam either being absorbed by or being reflected by the surface that it hits. So here we are with a nice parallel laser beam that passes through a lens and then focuses down to a very small area where the energy density gets huge. When we fire it at a piece of glass I'm going to look at that little spot there in a magnified way. So here we are with the beam coming down to hit the surface. Now remember it's a beam of light at this point in time, it's not heat and it's not until it hits this surface and get absorbs into here that it starts turning into heat. Now glass is a very very poor conductor of heat and so consequently what happens is this little teeny weeny area here starts heating up at a tremendous rate of knots and it expands because it's getting hotter and everything that gets hot expands but the background is still cool 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 all the way around and what that causes is at this point here where my arrow is it causes a lot of stress to occur expanded glass non-expanded glass and what actually happens is the there is a fracture that occurs between the hot and the cold zone and you get a little teeny weeny shard of glass popping out the closest I can get to imagine that is like a stone chip on your windscreen this is a mechanism basically of little stone chips and of course when you get a stone chip you can see it because the light gets reflected and refracted off different surfaces within the chip and so what looks like clear glass all of a sudden becomes frosted glass when you start putting hundreds and thousands of little teeny weeny chips beside each other. Now these chips are not exactly scientifically measurable or controllable. Every one could be slightly different. It just depends how the glass shards. If you've looked into glass engraving you will see that there are lots of hmm, call them tricks for trying to engrave glass nicely. I use the word nicely in inverted commas because how do you make something chip nicely? Now one of the oldest and simplest tricks for engraving glass is to coat the surface of it with soapy water. Now what does the soapy water do? Well first of all the soap in the water ensures that you get a nice even film across the surface of the glass but it's really the water that you want hanging on the surface of the glass. Now a film of water will do a very good job of absorbing the, the infrared light that's fired at it and so therefore our beam hits the surface of the water and it is the surface of the water that is boiling and creating heat. That heat then gets transferred quickly but in a slightly less dramatic fashion to the glass that's underneath. But of course it's almost instantly vaporizing the water and so yeah there isn't a great deal of difference between firing the beam at the water and firing the beam at the surface of the glass. So soapy water is not necessarily a very effective way to make the engraving action gentler. So the next trick that's used is to hold the water onto the surface in a different way and that's with wet kitchen towel. So now you've got two substances that are absorbing the energy. The first one is the water which will immediately vaporize and then of course you've got the kitchen towel which will effectively start to burn and what's happening is again you're reducing the heat intensity 
to the surface of the glass underneath. You're absorbing the energy before it hits the surface of the glass. But there is some transmitted heat that then passes to the surface of the glass that hopefully will cause a similar sort of rapid expansion and sharding, but it may well take place over a larger area. And so consequently, it may have a slightly softer feel to the sharding that takes place. Now there is another technique that you can use, and that's this stuff, masking tape. Now, again, let's just examine what's going on with masking tape. Same principle really. You've got the masking tape sitting on the surface with a glue of some sort underneath it. And the light arrives at the surface, turns into heat energy as it starts to burn the masking tape, and then that local heating effect has the sharding effect on the glass underneath. It's locally heating the glass underneath. In every one of these instances, the mechanical mechanism for engraving the glass is the same, but what you're doing is basically attenuating or moderating the heat to various degrees. Now, a technique that I personally use is something I discovered after I'd experimented with molybdenum disulfide on the surface of stainless steel. Understanding how the molybdenum disulfide acts the same as all these moderating layers here, but it's much more efficient at converting the heat and then producing a much wider... It absorbs the heat and starts to spread it out more because it is a metallic-based substance. And so consequently, you get a much bigger, wider pool of heat. And so you get a much gentler sharding action with molybdenum disulfide than you do with any of these other techniques. The problem with the masking tape is if you want to do a dot picture, you're going to finish up with lots and lots of little bits of masking tape on the surface that you can't easily pull off. If you just want to mask up for a logo, then masking tape probably does a reasonable job. I would steer clear of these two techniques personally that one has got some merit to it, but this one is what we're going to demonstrate today. You pays your money and takes your pick. Right, trying to find something challenging to put on the bottle is interesting. Now, this again brings up another interesting lesson. This is a black horse on a white background, basically. As you all know, when you frost glassed, it turns white or grey. So we shall need to reverse this image eventually from white and black to black and white to get the desired effect on glass. Also, the size of this picture is too big really to go on the bottle. About 190 millimetres tall. Half that size would be more appropriate. Let's check with the bitmap handle before we do anything and we find that the resolution is 160 pixels per inch. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the padlock closed and we're going to reduce this number to 50 percent. We're going to reduce the picture to half its size. Okay now let's go back and check what the bitmap handle now says. It was 160, now it's gone up to a resolution of 320 which is far too high for what we're trying to achieve especially as I've got a two inch lens in this machine. So we're going to set the resolution down with this tick box here, set output resolution to 160. And then we're also going to invert the color and apply to view and apply to source. That's what we're going to get. Again, you'll notice that we have got this at the top. Now depending on which way we're going to set the bottle up will depend on which way we set this picture around. So let's go and have a look at how we're going to set the bottle. Well you don't think I'm going to use a full bottle of wine do you? No. So here we've got our bottle prepared with uh, molly sulfide on the surface and looking at this we're going to have to use this end for the parallel end and this end, to try and keep it parallel, we shall have to raise this up to several levels higher. 
and also probably reset this so that the wheels are further apart. Maybe even five. Let's just see what five looks like. Five may cause the bottle to touch the bottom. But let's just give it a try. Now bear in mind we're trying to get a contact angle of probably somewhere around about 90 degrees. That looks good. I think this probably needs to go together one more. So we'll set this in by one. Then we'll find out the height that we have to be to get it running parallel. Now I've got a nice wooden spirit level here which won't damage the surface of my material and that looks pretty good. We'll set the height in a minute but the whole purpose of this was if you remember to work out which way our drawing is going to have to go. So we want ears to the right because this picture here will come out exactly the same as if we were engraving it on the table. There's no reversals, no amplification of any sort in any direction. In an anti-clockwise direction, which is minus 90. Like that. Okay, now we've still got our start point in the centre at the top. So that's good. So that enables us to decide approximately where we want the picture on the bottle. So we need to set the focus up to about seven and a half. We'll push the head further back and we'll push the frame as far back as it will go and pull it forward just a shade and then we'll bring the table forward and we'll pull it forward just a shade more. Watch the bearings here because this is where it's going to contact. Don't look for anything here. There we go, we're just about to make contact now. There we go, and we've pushed it forward. We can now make sure that it's pushed back against the bearing blocks. Now we should need to set it roughly towards the middle here. Let's try that. It's not that important in this particular instance. So we set the origin there. Air assist. Yeah, I think we do need some air assist this time, but maybe not complete full air assist. So let's think about our cutting parameters. Well, they're not cutting, they're engraving. So it's a bitmap and it's a scan. So yes, we've got scan on. Speed, 100. Bearing in mind, we are doing a dot image. And I think therefore maybe it'd be a good idea to keep that back closer to about 130, maybe. And the power, well, the power, we need to keep that quite low because we don't want to, if you like, crack through the glass. So my guess is that we're going to set this to probably something like about 15%. 15%. Maybe even lower than that. So let's try 12%. If I get it wrong, well, I can soon empty another bottle. Pitch. Now that's an interesting point. Because we're doing a dot graphic, we really ought to make the pitch match the graphic. So 25.4 divided by 160 pixels per inch equals 0 0.1587. 0 0.1587. Okay. And I think we're ready to go. Now, as I mentioned to you before, I don't like the smell of molybdenum and disulfide. It's a bit suspicious. So I'm going to close the lid and let the Purex extraction unit make things safe for me. Now I've not done this before, so this is a brand new experiment for me. I think the first thing you can see is we've got an image on there of some sort. Question is, what sort of image? Well, let me just clean off half the bottle because if I need to, we can try an image on the other side because it's only gone a little way round. 
And I have to say, on balance, that's not too bad. Um, a little bit pixelated, but generally not too bad. I wonder whether I could increase the resolution slightly. And maybe increase the size of the picture. Because I've got room on the other side of the bottle. So I think that's what we'll do for test number two. Okay, well we've done several things this time. We've changed the resolution to 240 dots per inch and the interval accordingly. Um, we'll just make sure that we press these up against the end stop there. We're in roughly the same central position so we should be okay. And I've increased the picture or rather, instead of decreasing the picture to 50%, I've decreased the picture to 75%. So we should get a bigger picture, higher resolution, and I've increased the power from 12% to 13%. So we get a fraction more power. Okay, let's see what we've got this time. Wow, I would say that's looking pretty good. Before we take the molly off, I have to say, I think that is pretty impressive. Now with the molybdenum disulfide, this finish comes out silky smooth, just as if you were to fine sandblast it or bead blast it. And of course, as I said, the glass turns white because it's basically a, what I call a binary material. And the only way that you can see the, the black of the black horse that's on there is by having a black background. Now, um, sadly, this is not wine that I've put in here. This is black coffee. That result there was a starting point, a bit patchy, not very good. But it does show that larger size, finer resolution, even with a two inch lens in this machine, um, I'm able to get some pretty good results with the pictures if you choose the right picture and get the sort of contrast factor right. Well, all in all, I'm extremely pleased with that. Um, but of course, we mustn't forget the real star of the show, which was this little piece of kit here. So yeah, it served its purpose, and it also enabled me to test my dotting theory on some glass, which I've never done before. And uh, it's a step in the right direction for what we should probably be exploring in a future session, trying to improve the resolution of the pictures because my dotting stuff was all about working with organic materials. Now I know that there are great gains to be had when we move away from organic materials into minerals such as glass, slate, even things like anodized aluminium hold great promise. So I think that's all for a future session. But for the time being, I'm getting ready with another bottle to test. So. Yeah, I shall see you in the next session, I think, because, yeah, I am feeling fruity now. Bye.